All right, everybody, everybody. Oh my God. I, you know, <laughs> I have said on occasion or two that I couldn't sleep last night thinking about the, uh, the, the interview the next day. This is one of those occasions. Uh, I, now, let me tell you something, my friends. I'm Anthony Brogdon. And um, all my interviews are good. Not because of me, because of the people who decide to come on my channel. All my interviews are good. I don't put <laughs> no one interview on top of another. But let me tell you one thing, my friends. When I interview someone who has a story like the lady that's coming on my channel today, I wear a shirt, tie, and a suit in their honor. You hear me? All my interviews are good. There's no question about it. All of them have their own set of significance. But when I have an interview like the lady that I have on the channel today, I wear a shirt and tie, and I rarely wear them these days. <laughs> Only because, I mean, you know, it's a little more casual atmosphere, bada boom, bada bing. Uh, I can wear a dress shirt, not wear a tie to it, but not on this occasion. Not on this occasion. I am excited that she is on my channel. I found her somehow only because I have another gentleman that I interviewed who lives, and I guess he lives, but his museum is not far from hers in his interview. And he's in Helena, Arkansas. In his interview, he mentions what she's going to talk about. I said, what? I never heard of it. I'm, mm. I'm getting you closer to what the topic is, my friends. <laughs> How about this? We've all, and I know all of us who at least listen and watch my channel, and I got some consciousness, whatever, whatever, right, have heard of what happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. I'm getting you closer to the topic. She's got a similar story. She's got a similar story. I am going to do all that I possibly can in my power through you, my viewers, through strong inspirations to help get this story out. To help get this story out. Excuse me. When I found her, I sent the message. She got the message and she responded. Now check it out. Now hold on. She she vetted me. <laughs> <laughs> she checked me out. Yep. I got to be on to something for her to agree to come on my channel. Because <laughs> you know what I do, my friends? I give it to you straight, no chaser. I let the people do the talking. That's the, 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 the premise of this channel. <clears throat> what I, 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 how about this? Before I go, because uh, it's, it's on my heart, I want to let you know I'm having a festival in Quindaro, Kansas. Little old me, Memorial Day weekend 2020, more details to come. And mm. I'm going to at least two, three other cities around the country next year. And when I go... And it's under this black uh, uh, history uh, uh, umbrella, I'm inviting you. Might not be the same as big as what may do with Kundero, but I'm gonna say, come and check me out. Because I really wanna meet you if you're watching me. I wanna shake your hand and I wanna, you know, bada boom, bada bing, right? Um, I, what I want you to do, my friends, cause it's happening. I'm already over 500 and I'm growing. Mm -hmm. And that's subscribers. Hit the subscribe button. It's free. It, it just it, it just because I want you to. How about that? <laughs> Do it for me because I want you to. I want you to like this video because she's going to blow your mind. 
she might make you tear up. She might make you tear up. Hit the like button. Hit the notifications bell for when I put these videos up and I'm doing four or five of them a week. And I, 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 I how about this? I'm not so good yet where I'm going to tell you when I'm putting them up other than when I tweet it. Follow me on Twitter at A Strong Dream. So I'm not going to say to you, my friends, every Wednesday at 11 o'clock, every Friday, at, I ain't doing that. Nah, you just got to hit that, that notifications bell or just, you know, when it come up, you'll know it's there. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put no pressure on me. Uh, I want you to tell somebody about strong inspiration. Don't keep this to yourself. No, don't do it. Don't do that. Tell somebody. Uh, on a personal note, you know that I'm a filmmaker and I'm serious about my game. That I, 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 I've done two documentaries, one called The Great Detroit. I'm in Detroit. And the other one is this one right here. It's called Business in the Black. The rise of black business in America. I got a, a guy who he starts and ends the movie. He was 101 years ago, one years old when he was in my film. He lived to be 103. His last remarks in the film is, you can't tell me nothing. Mm -hmm. Watch this. It's, it's streaming on Amazon. And hmm. I'm working now to get it on Tubi and Hulu and them other ones so you can watch it just, you know, on your smart TV. I'm, I'm getting better at my game. Hmm. I start somewhere and I'm going to end up someplace else. Watch me. <laughs> watch my movie. I really want y'all to do that. And this is really what I want you to do. And I, I know you're doing it because my numbers is up. Uh, is uh, Order my book. Order the book. Uh, it's very reasonably, very, very reasonably priced. I don't tell the price, but it's very reasonably. You're going to be shocked. You'll be like, yo, man, I can get four or five of them. And uh, it's business. No, it's called Black Business Book, over 200 facts. And <laughs> there's a chapter in the book, because it's not just about business. The, the majority of it, 80% is about business. But there's a chapter in the book, it's in that 20% of what them racists did to us when they got mad. That's what she gonna talk about. What they did to us when they got mad for no reason. You don't want us to have nothing? And you want us to take advantage of us forever? Come on, who wanna stand for that? You wouldn't, Mr. Racist Man. <laughs> it's in my book. And it's not just in Tulsa, but you might have heard of what happened in Rosewood and Bowie mm -hmm. and some other cities and in her city. I'm getting you closer to what I'm talking about here, my friend. Read my book. Come on, get your man. I, I, I'd love to get 100 people to order the book tonight, as you can uh, understand. But I really love you because you know what? Every 10th book I sell, I donate one to a school. Mm. Every 10th book I sell, I donate one to. This is bigger than me. I, and I figure if I, if I keep doing good work, good things happen. And so I got some good people that's tweeting it out. They follow me. They like what I'm doing. And I just got to be more patient. So get a copy of my book. I really appreciate it. Go to businessintheblack.net. All them credit cards, PayPal. You can even cash at me. And, and get a copy of the book. Go to the website. I don't tell the price. I, I, I'm, I'm, I gotta say this, my friends. You, you uh, I, And I say it all the time, but this is very, very appropriate, I'm sure, once you hear her story. I use the word strong a lot, right? Strong in my world stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. That's my introduction to the sisters on my channel because she's a strong lady. <laughs> Come on, introduce yourself. Let's get it on. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Mr. Rogden. I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk with you tonight. Uh, my name is Lisa Hicks Gilbert, and I am the founder and managing director of Descendants of the Elaine Massacre of 1919. 
I'm originally from, born and raised in Elaine, Arkansas and the surrounding communities. All right, we're and, gonna talk um, about you before we mm -hmm. get to the story. Just a tad, sister. Mm -hmm. You, 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 uh, this show calling? This has become my calling. It was not my journey. I, well, I didn't think this was gonna be my journey, but here I am. Here you are. Here I am. Was you born in Elaine? Born, raised, graduated. What, 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 what is, there. where is Elaine, Arkansas, and what kind of city is it? That kind of thing. Elaine is, Elaine, Arkansas is um, in the Delta, in the um, right, on the Mississippi River. If anyone's familiar with Helena, Helena, Arkansas, right. Um, we're right, you know, right in Helena Bridge, right across the river from Mississippi. So it's in the um, southern eastern part of Arkansas in the Delta. Okay, right no, okay, two, then two you hours the word Delta. What, what is the Delta? What, what is what? What all is, is in the Delta? In the Delta, you have uh, what uh, communities are in the Delta? Well, yes. uh, Elaine sits in Phillips County. It sits in Phillips County. It's Phillips County, Arkansas, and Phillips County is the poorest county in the state of Arkansas. And um, yeah, so Elaine sits in Phillips County. Um, in the del on the you know in the delta. Why uh, they right call it the delta? What, what do you think that is? Why do they call it? The, you know what? That's a good question. I've never, you know, really thought about it. But yeah, it's it's the delta. That's oh, what they call okay. it. The so, yeah, that region of Arkansas is what we call the delta. Is there uh, when you're there? Are there signs that says in the delta and you know bumper stickers and I'm proud no. of being in the delta, whatever, whatever. Actually, no. Actually, no. Okay. Mm -mm. And now that you mention it, no, okay. it's not. But but people do use that term. Oh yeah, people use that term Delta. The Delta. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. How big is Elaine? Elaine, uh, population wise, is six hundred. Currently, is six hundred and thirty six. That's in the that, town. So of you Elaine. know everybody. Everybody know everybody. Yeah, everybody. Just, <laughs> pretty much everyone knows everyone. And, and 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 so do uh is there major stores in in Elaine? I mean, um, no. we ain't got to name names. They ain't, they ain't buy no ads, but you know what I mean. No, no, no major stores. The only store which serves as you know the uh, convenience store, which serves as the grocery store, the everything store is Dollar General. That's the pretty much the only store in Elaine. It's Dollar General. Y'all got street lights? No. No street lights. No, uh, no street lights. And so Elaine is probably, if you could say, what, 20 square miles or something like that? Maybe a little less than 20 square miles. Is Elaine a pretty city? <sighs> pretty in terms of scenery. It's got some landscape or something? It, well, when you go to Elaine, it's rural. Uh, you see a lot of fields, a lot of land, um, you know, during the season, you see a lot of cotton fields, bean fields. It's really a rural area. It's rural, the city okay. Is, yeah, really a rural community. It's a small rural community. And 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 uh, so when you want a uh, party, you got to go to Helena. You usually have to go to Helena. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you want a party, you have, you have to go to Helena. If if that if that's your thing to do, Helena. A lot of people come to Little Rock, they might go to Forest City, even Memphis. Memphis is about an hour away from Oh, okay, life. yeah. So, yeah, you can get some action mm -hmm. in Memphis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you can get some action. Yeah. Then Mississippi, have Clarksdale, a, uh, Mississippi, and all of that. Okay, we're going to couple more questions on this, uh, on the town. Y'all got a radio station? Where do y'all get your radio before you can hear Black music? No no radio station in Elaine. Yeah, but you can hear the music out of, uh, out of Memphis, can't you? Uh, I think so. Usually, but there's a radio station in Helena. Mm -hmm. Oh, so there's a black station in Helena you, that might yes, play there is. Sundays mm -hmm. or every, is it every day or just on one day a week they play black music? I'm not sure. Really? I'm not sure. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, but there's a radio station in, in Helena. It has been for a while. That mm -hmm. you can get some music. How about this? Yeah. Can you, um, can you, uh, Oh, uh, shucks. So you so you went to school there? Mm-hmm. Graduated from Elaine High School. So it's called Elaine High School. Elaine High School. Elaine, well, uh, is, uh, a couple more. Closed. What's the, uh, the a percentage of Black in the town? Uh, well, the, the, 
well, the school's closed. So we don't, we no longer have a school in Elaine. Mm-hmm. Our school's closed. Yeah, but, mm-hmm. the, but Elaine is a uh, uh, 90% black. Are there some white people there? I, oh yeah, there are white people there. I'm going to say about 60, maybe 65% of the community is people, yeah, is black. Mm-hmm. Was it founded as a black township? No, it wasn't founded as a black township. Um, no, definitely not. Um, when it was founded, it was, you know, of course, it was a swamp area rule and people came in and, you know, uh, turned it into farmland. Most of the black people came in as the land was being developed and came in from Mississippi as sharecroppers. Okay, we're moving up the timeline. Why did your folks move there? Mm-hmm. How did they get there? Uh, because, of, well, actually, I found out that some of the, you know, that there have been hits in uh, the Elaine area, in Phillips County area, since as far back as 1916. And some of them actually came over to help develop the land and, you know, clear the land, cut down trees and help clear the land. Now, when you and say develop, course, that's what you that mean. That's what you mean. I'm sorry. When you say develop, that's what you mean. Develop the land. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, when once the land was developed and the landowners needed, pe- you know, were looking for sharecroppers, they went back over to Mississippi. A lot of them came in by way of South Carolina, came in the Miss, went over to Mississippi and told them about this rich, fertile land right across the river, and you know, land of opportunity, and. They were looking for share, wanted sharecroppers. You can go come over there and get some land. We'll work the land, save your money, and possibly buy some of this land for yourself and have your own farms. And so they came over, you know, the ones that were over, helped clearing the land, went over to Mississippi and told them about this land and families galore okay. start pouring into the Phillips County. Okay, so that uh, you, you got me on something right there. It was a big thing to own some land. And to, if you was a farmer, to have your own land and farm and said, okay, I, I, I didn't kind of mm-hmm. hit it now that I can do it. Yeah. yeah, but they didn't come in originally, come in buying land of their own. They came over and became sharecroppers. Mm-hmm. And, you know, of course, they were told, you know, we're going to split this with you 50-50, fair and square. You know, the sharecroppers yeah. were told, Black sharecroppers were told, uh, come share crop this land and of course they let them take things up at the store they had the little stores yeah you know the, the landowners had the land and the stores yeah. that the sharecroppers had to buy you know get their supply they didn't buy them they got them on credit yeah okay before and you then, go there we're gonna be gonna mm-hmm. get there but i got a couple more okay. questions on you don't uh, and i i mean no <laughs> disrespect on this oh no no did no, your no, father no, read and write i'm sorry did Most your father did what now? Did your father read and write? Did my father read and write? Yes, yes, my father could. But your grandfather, could he read and write? My grandfather, no. No. So so when you say no, you're talking about when couldn't he not read and write? Let's say he was born in 1870. My grandfather, now you're talking, my grandfather was, my grandfather was born in 1924, okay. 1924. So your great grandfather was born. This is in... my, my great grandfather. This he was born in the early 18. I mean the late 1800s. Could he mm-hmm. read and write? No, he could not read and write. Most of the share crop, most of them coming over. You know, this is barely 50 years after slavery. Barely 50 years after slavery. I got you. Mm-hmm. So uh, a lot of them could not read and write. Okay, well that's that's deep. I wanna I wanted everybody to hear this. What does that mean? You can't because you never went to school. They never had school for you. Well, I mean, now some people could not read and write, but then again, there were a lot of them who could read and write because they eventually became organizers and uh, wrote bylaws and you know. So and we'll get to that part of the story about okay, we'll get to, okay, we, we, uh, we go, that's the that's the end about. of it. I, I mm-hmm. want to develop. I want to figure that out a little bit. Yeah, you can't read and write because okay. at at the age of four and five, what did you do? Did you, every day at age of four and five? Yeah, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What did you do mm-hmm. as a kid? The, uh, not back- you, them. What what could they do? 
They didn't well, go to school. Well, at that time, especially if they were working, if their parents were sharecroppers, a lot of times four and five and six year olds, they were in the fields picking cotton with them. Is that right? Oh yeah, you you see a lot of pictures of you know of sharecroppers picking cotton, and you'll see kids there with a gunny sack on their back, right along with their parents picking cotton too. So they never went to school. They, I mean, I, I, it all depends. Some some kids did go to school because they end up having black school. There are some, you know, who learn to read and write, and they would have adults and children there together teaching them to read and write. So it all was the teachers. You know, was it white people or black people that were the teachers? Oh no no think? no! Back mm -mm. back then it was it was black because they just had all black schools. <laughs> you know, yeah. So the teachers were black. Yeah, most of the teachers were the ones who could read and write. You know, made a point to help teach. You know, as many who wanted to learn to read and write, and sometimes their their lessons were in the evenings at home after they finished working in the fields. Mm -hmm. And that's just that's just a historical context of just learning, not from this story, but just learning in general about yes. Yes. The education and how uh, slaves and former slaves and their descendants learned and how they went to school and became educated. Okay, we well, almost. I, I want to because I'm a northern guy and I don't know nothing about this, so that's why. I okay. Say, okay. How about okay. that? Back in the day, what kind of uh, house did they live in? Well, the looking at the pictures of the houses, you know, I would see just board houses. A lot of them used for insulation. They would use newspapers, mud, whatever to kind of insulate the houses. But most times, just you know, like just flat board houses that they would live in. What our not house? too not too far removed from the houses they used to live in when they were you know during slavery, because you know back then they even they built their own. Uh, um, outhouses. They had to go in the bathroom and the outhouse. Oh, yeah. and that kind they of had, thing. Yeah, of course. Back then there were outhouses. Mm -hmm. And and no no lights. I'm sure. No, no, just oil lamps. Mm -hmm. kerosene type lamps um and 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 as a result of that are, the, are some of those still standing oh uh, no 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 so then you move mm -hmm. up the timeline and now things are uh you're moving up through the 19 you know 1990s 1990 1900s and mm -hmm. uh slavery is ended and whatnot is there a uh, one of them um, uh, uh, freedom schools? Uh, you know what I mean that that gets mm -hmm. built in that town? No, not in Elaine, not in not in Phillips County. Not that I'm aware of. There were that you know were there any type of freedom schools? Not during that time. So the the first real official school may have been open when the mo first official school, yeah. black school or white yeah. school? Yeah, yeah, that you that the kids could go to regularly. That for, uh, were for black kids. Yes. That uh, fit, well, I went to school and I started out going to school in Snow Lake. That's farther down the road, maybe another thirty minutes down the road from Elaine, one another little small town. And how did you get there? Had uh, well, I went to school in Snow Lake, and we rode the bus, I believe, and I, <laughs> I can't remember if when yeah, I was in yeah, elementary yeah. So a bus picked y'all mm -hmm. up from the end of the block mm -hmm. in the corner mm -hmm. and took you to school. Yeah, and then was we that an all black school? Was that was that black uh, uh, black and whites that you went to school with? Uh, no, not when I was in elementary school. All black. Mm -hmm. It was all black school that I remember. I don't remember going to school with any. I think I believe it was all black kids that went to you, school when did, I went to school in elementary. You think? You got a decent education there. Was your did you have good books and you had got homework? You said, did I have believe did I got get a, a decent, decent education, education there in elementary school? I, you know, I would say I did because most of my teachers in elementary school were people we knew. It was the pastor. It was people who oh, right okay. there in I my community you. that I knew and grew up with. And you know, cared about us. They were all family and I, I love saw, it. I love it. Yeah. I love outside it. of out, mm -hmm, so they cared about us. And we had a wonderful teacher, Mr. Freddie Hall. He was a pastor, he was our teacher, he was our best friend's father. So he was one of the best. I if I remember any teacher, I remember Mr. Freddie Hall, best teacher. That, I love uh, it. Mm -hmm, so 
Okay, so now we have people that care about don't get the best. Just a tad, or leave back up, back mm -hmm. on the timeline. The biggest yeah. industry was sharecropping there for for oh, black yeah. people. Mm -hmm. During that okay, time, was sharecropping. What is a sharecropper? A sharecropper is some. It's usually a sharecropper was a someone a former slave or sharecropping came about when slavery was over and the white landowner still needed someone to harvest that first of all he still needed someone who knew how to grow the cotton who knew how to take care of the cotton then who knew how to harvest the cotton and bale the cotton you got to realize you had all of these slaves and then once slavery was over with the slaver, slaves were the only ones who knew how to do the work <laughs> Oh really? Okay. <laughs> I mean, they knew how to do it to use the tools because usually the white landowners in the house or off doing whatever. He wasn't doing that that manual labor in the fields. Okay. So, um, sharecropping came about when a deal was struck between the landowner and uh, the person, and they, they agreed to split the harvest 50-50 if the landowner provided the land and provided the seed and the supplies. And okay, then the sharecropper would go plant harvest. And then at the end of that harvest, they would decide on the price or beforehand the price that they were going to be paid for that that cotton, oh, for the, oh, you oh, know, for the harvest. Cotton. Oh, okay, let me ask you this. I want to go back just a tad, but how do you plant mm -hmm. cotton? How do you plant co seed? Yeah, the seed for cotton. Yeah. Yeah. Back back then, how you plant it back yeah. then. Yeah, it was going literally going. Well, you had to plow. You had horses or mules or okay. ox or whatever it is you use, but you tilling the land with a plow, with the yes. shaped plow yes. with the handle, yes. with the team of mules or horses yes. or whatever pulling it. Okay. And then somebody coming behind you, usually, you know, if you plant it, whoever's in your family, kids, wife, yes. whomever, they're dropping the seeds as you plow. Okay. Yeah. The little okay. trench going down through there. Okay. I know this because I, I grew up on the field. <laughs> okay, I got you. I got you. Could you, could you, um, how long did it take between the time you planted for the for it to harvest? Oh, usually they start planting in the spring and harvest like this now. They're like right now, my brothers and my family and friends and everybody is down in Elaine right now harvesting. So you're They're talking harvesting. about in April and then the harvest is in September. In in the sep yeah, in September. You start in September because you're gonna be through by the you're gonna be finished by the end of October, but right in the middle of October, you're finished. So this is harvest season right now. Okay. Uh, if if I'm a sharecropper and mm -hmm. I got a plant and harvest, how do I get money between April and October? How do I survive if I gotta wait till October to get some money? You know, you don't need any money. The landowner has a store and he's going to let you take up or put on credit. We used to call it take up. You know, you take it up at the store. That means you have an account at the store and whatever you need, you go in there and he mark down how much, you know, you owe for that, those supplies you just got. And at, when harvest season comes, y'all settle up. That's okay. I got mm -hmm. you. I got mm -hmm. you. And you settle up. I got one more question and we're going to stay on that one more. Do you okay. wish you didn't live there? Do you wish no. you had lived in the North and had it? No. No. Because I, and, that's your, and, that, you, you, you love that. I No, I didn't love that. I love my people. I the love people the that you grew up of with, my the people that's there. The people and that's there. And so at, at times, like, okay, you ain't got no money, you know, per se, mm -hmm. if you don't mind, I say mm -hmm. that. Could you but on Friday night, y'all went out and found a way to get somebody got some liquor. Somebody had enough to have a mm -hmm. big dinner. That's, all, all you got, you got, a, ate, field, that kind you of got thing. a field full of corn. You can make your, all the liquor you want. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. You got a field full of corn or your neighbor over there got corn and you got barley and you got whatever it is you use, hops, whatever you use, you, you know. And, and if that, if that's not moonshine. That's just corn liquor. Corn liquor. Mm hmm. Oh, that stuff is strong, though, ain't it? Oh, yeah. But it could be moonshine. I mean, it all depends. They made that, a way. That, that corn know? liquor is like 90 proof. Oh, yeah. You can't. I, 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 I remember one time I was with an uncle of mine. He had a touch of that. I poured that much of it. He said, Man, you crazy. 
you can't do nothing but sniff this because <laughs> it's strong, isn't it? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And so again, was it was it enough for you or them? Would you say that on Sunday y'all had enough dinner to have a good meal every Sunday? These people were hunters, fishers. I mean, Elaine, right now. Oh, I, I can got tell you, you the like last it. time I paid for fish out of a store. I don't buy fish out of a store. My brothers fish. I can show you picture. I mean, the best fish, fresh water, oh, catfish, yes. buffalo. Uh, okay. My daddy, they hunt. We 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 didn't go hungry because, you know, people in Elaine, I tell people, they hunt, they fish, they have gardens. And then when you have gardens and the women are pickling, you know, doing that. And then you have, you know, back then they'd have the, you know, the white land, on, the, his, their wives wanting to buy the vegetables, their eggs, oh, they had chicken. Yeah, okay. Then they had hogs, they slaughtering them. Then they bartering and trading. And this person might grow have a lot of hogs. This person might have potato, you know, okay. potatoes. They did bartering, and you know, not everybody did five, six different things. You might have your specialty in this, and you can trade your potatoes for whatever. You know, oh, that was the okay. system. Okay. That was the system. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I love it then. Yeah. And it was, was the there system. ever, uh, uh, even then, was there uh, some celebration that everybody came together? once a month or some particular time of the year and it was just a joyous occasion I, you know what outside of holidays or weddings something like that i don't know because you, you're talking about hard-working people even when the harvest well you know you finish planting you're going to be doing all of the other stuff you got, got your chickens you got this so they still working sun up to sundown but of course church church was very important yeah i was going to ask you, know, you that having yes. church pick having church picnics that was a big thing you know i i did that even with you know growing up yeah we have church after church on sundays even if it's just in the church yeah outside or what have you i but, love um, it i love mm -hmm. it uh oh, yeah you they said had that <laughs> okay you said picnic that i heard oh, yeah. you don't use that term well you know what and i know the history and the story about the picnic and hey i i feel you but and i guess until we come up i guess we'll say uh that's what i like feast. i like the word we'll, picnic. we'll say yeah. church feast we'll say after church feast <laughs> i got you but i like the word picnic because i know what it yeah. means oh yeah okay oh, yeah so then what happened is these sharecroppers was there they were making a way mm -hmm. they had to settle up with the white man who had both mm -hmm. the store and land and everything right. and now what's what's going on well um after a year or so of being cheated out of their okay, harvest. Now before you get to the being cheated, you're being okay. cheated when? You are being cheated come harvest time. Come harvest and it's time. time to sell it's time to um sell your cotton, uh weigh your cotton, sell it, see how much you're gonna get. But then what the store owner would do was give you the price of what you know what your cotton is worth. Then, but before you could get what was due you back, you had to settle up your account at the store. And what was happening, it was a lot of times the cost of the um what they owed the store owed owed the storekeep would be more than what their you know harvest was worth. So that happened, you know, they were just being cheated, uh, char over overcharged for their supplies. I got you. What, Mm -hmm. And what they owe at the store. Could and you? So been, I could, how about this? And we're gonna get into the story real right after this question. Could, mm -hmm. could you have been said, okay, you know, like you do a business nowadays, you can say, okay, I need five thousand dollars worth of supplies. Mm -hmm. I need. I'm. I, I figure that I'm a budget myself with five thousand dollars worth of. I'm talking about supplies to do the harvest. I'm talking about. Uh -huh. I'm a budget myself on. I'm a buy. $5,000 worth of clothes and, you know, goods to deal with every day for the next so period of time. So that's $10,000 I got to come up with. Yeah. I know I got to pick. He tells me that my cotton is worth such and such. So I got to pick so many pounds of cotton to go over mm -hmm. $10,000. That, 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 that's too much thinking and stuff to do it that way. So you really just don't have no clue of what, what, the, what, how it's going to end up at the end of the day. Mm-mm. No. 
You have no, well, you, and again, we're going to go back to where you were saying that a lot of times, you know, coming out of slavery, a lot of black people couldn't read and write. Yeah, I got you. Mm -hmm. Couldn't read and write. And then the uh, storekeep has a right. He's going to charge you what he wants to charge you. Yeah, I of got course, you there. He's he going to charge you what he wants to charge you for the supplies. But again, you have, uh, you know, the sharecroppers, they might not have been able to read and write, but they had you. sense enough to know that if cotton is 25 cent a pound or 35 cent a pound and I go and I weigh this and they kind of know how much yes you know the supplies should be costing right. them they know that at the end their harvest shouldn't be more than what I got you, you. know they're charged at the store I got you I got mm -hmm. you there and it's happening and you're seeing it happen to every every sharecropper on this farm harvesting mm -hmm. so and so at some point in time, y'all get to thinking there's no, and so if you don't, if you owe him some money at the end and he know you ain't got the money, what happens then? If you don't have the, he knows you have the crop. He knows you have the crop. Is that what you mean? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. When I, I, I turn in my harvest, this is all the cotton I got, man. Mm -hmm. All that you see there is all I got. Yeah. You tell me I'm short. So then what you going to do to me? Oh, then you just owe that. Don't, they don't do it. You just, you don't get any money and they just owe that. That just stays on your bill and you, you still owe oh, it. Oh, I yeah. see. I see. You see? I and see. what it was, was just a way to continue to keep you in debt. And one of the, there was just an unspoken law. I, most people say rule, wasn't a rule. It was an unspoken law, unwritten law that if you owe, you couldn't leave. Like if you owe and try to oh, go to another I farm. Oh, I see. Ahead. Yeah. So that just, it kept you there. It kept you there. Okay, so then now what happens? These brothers and sisters, y'all, they get wise to this and say, I, this ain't working. And then it's what happened? Because it's happening, you know, not just in Phillips County, it's happening all over sharecroppers. I mean, it's in the air. Everyone's hearing the stories. These are stories of what's happening. I got and you. in comes Robert, and then in comes Robert L. Hill. He's an organizer. And he comes and he he's a black man. Black man, Robert L. Hill. He's a he had Hill. education. Education, yes. Um, he, he comes lived in, in any lane. No, no, no. Well, he lived in. He was uh, from Newport. He lived in Winchester, Arkansas. His mother lived right down past in Rashaw. He uh, had lived in Memphis, so he was just kind of going from town to town. He was organizing the sheriff. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay organizing sharecroppers okay and he created the progressive farmers household union of america oh i love created some bylaws mm -hmm, uh to organize the sharecroppers to fight for a uh, better price for their cotton and also a fair accounting of their accounts at the you know land i on the got stores. you i love it mm -hmm. now this is when and, mm -hmm, i'm sorry when is this this is in what well, he started the organization in 1918 Okay, I got you. Mm -hmm. So up until then, you know, they started like in 1918 talking okay. about, okay, we're going to start organizing everyone come together and put our money together and hire attorneys to sue the white landowners. Oh, okay, it was 1919. You. you have black sharecroppers banding together, organizing and hiring two white attorneys <laughs> to sue the white landowners for okay. a fair counting of their books and ensure that these uh, uh, attorneys could go and look at their books for them and make sure that the landowners were treating them fairly and charging okay, them. Okay, I got you. I got you. I love it. Mm -hmm. yes. And then what happened? Well, they were organizing. Going, They had already had a few meetings and come September 30th, that's middle harvest season now. They're still harvesting cotton and beans and corn and stuff is still in the fields. I say cotton and corn because that was the... Uh, most pop popular uh, okay, I got uh, you. crop. So uh, come September 30th, they meet to organize uh, in Hoopsburg. That's three miles north of Elaine in okay. a little small town called, little small spot called Hoopsburg, Arkansas. Just three oh. miles up from Elaine. That's okay. where the church was. Okay. And they meet there late at night. And because they had been threatened 
and some of the landowners had been whispering, telling some of the sharecroppers, don't go to any more meetings, stop going, stop doing what you're doing. They had guards posted up outside of the church. Okay, hold on. The How about did. this? Who told the white guys that they were meeting? It's still, that's that's still. Because <laughs> what, what, be what they told to don't tell them? Was they told to don't tell told, them? Yeah, they even had secret handshakes. When you come into the meeting, you know, they didn't just let anybody in. Okay, I love it. Mm -hmm. Didn't let anybody in. So, but of course the landowners got wind of it and uh, had been threatening and talking, telling some of them to stop going to these meetings. And uh, they were meeting at the church that night and about 11 o'clock that night, um, four or five vehicles pull up. Now in most books you read, it's gonna be read that one vehicle pulled up. But um, we know now there was more than one okay. pulled up. And some of them were um, detectives of officers from the uh, um, railroad. Okay. Mm-hmm and pulled up and they say it was a trustee, a black trustee from Helena that told them that the meeting was gonna be happening that night. Oh, so that, that's the church. snitch dude there. That's the snitch dude, uh, Smitty, S-M-I-T-T-Y, <laughs> last well, name know who it Smitty. Is. Oh yeah, they got his name, last name Smitty. And, uh, but yeah, they pulled up and started shooting in the church. And of no, course- Didn't ask they, no questions. Didn't ask any question that they said in no words exchanged, start shooting in the church. What they were not expecting were the sharecroppers armed, ready, and start shooting back. Why were they ready? Because they were just ready anyway, or they heard that this might happen. They heard they had they had been warned. They were expecting trouble. They were expecting trouble. They, you know, they had been meeting, having some meetings at some of the other churches. And some of the uh, sharecroppers had been warned. Some of the landowners were telling them, "Don't, you know, don't go to any more meetings." So yeah, so they shoot they in the church. They expect trouble. They shot into the church, shot the church up, shot the church up, killing some of the men, women, and children inside of the church. Did they got an estimate how many that was? No, because okay. the next morning the white mob came back to the church and burnt it down. Oh man! Mm -hmm. But then you told me that they they that they were armed. Uh huh. The, the black sharecroppers were armed, and they shot back. And uh, one of the white men in the car, he was shot and killed. He was shot and killed in the car. So, and they, you know, they haven't determined who shot and killed him. There are so many rumors around who who shot him. Some people said it might have been one of the men he was riding with accidentally, friendly fire, accidentally shot him. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but he was shot. He was last name Atkins, so he was he was shot and killed, and that really um, triggered it because they got in their cars and they went back to Helena and said, you know, there's an insurrection. You know, black people in Hel in Elaine, you know, threatening to shoot and kill, and they said they had accidentally stumbled upon the church that night that they had, you know. By accident, they didn't mean to go to the church. Man, that nobody night. believe that. So then they what happened? That. So then what and, happened? And then the uh, they, when they went back to Helena the next morning, uh, they came back and they more of them came. You know, it was a mob that a white mob descended upon Elaine the next morning, and they burned the church down, set the church of fire, and burned it down, and uh, just started killing, shooting, and killing. Black people. Let me just stop right. Everybody, women. that's why I got my suit on in my time. Mm -hmm. Start shooting and killing men, women, and children. When people walking down the street and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, most of them were in the fields. From so as my grandmother said, she was some of them. They were, you know, not had gotten up. Some people who weren't at the meeting didn't even know. That, really? Yeah. That ones that weren't at the meeting that night didn't even know what had happened. At the, and then some people were just in the fields, gotten up the next morning, going into the field, into the field, start harvesting. And uh, I mean, at that time that, at that time, the sharecroppers, black people in Elaine outnumbered white people two to one because see, it's harvest season. Not only was you. it the, yeah, not only was it the people that lived there, you had people who traveled from county to county, farm to farm, 
you know, might not have a farm on his own of his own, but he's traveling, you know, working, I got helping you. the harvest. So you had it was a lot of people, black people in the town, and they fought them off. When the mob came, the white mob came and descended upon Elaine and started shooting and killing uh, black people. They uh, sent one young boy to Lambrook. That's in the Lambrook, it's in the back of Elaine, like 10 miles back of Elaine, not quite 10 miles. Sent what he rode there, told them what was happening. And the people in Lambrook, the sharecroppers in Lambrook, um, took up arms and came in to help you know, the other black sharecroppers. And that's why when you see the charges against the sharecroppers, they were charged with night riding. But it wasn't night when they rode in. They rode in and teamed up with the rest of the black sharecroppers and fought that white mob off. And that white mob left, went back to Helena. And that's when they called in the, uh, called the governor and told the governor, we have an insurrection. Black people are down here, you know, shooting and murdering uh, white people and asked the governor to send troops because see they were outnumbered. They knew they couldn't fight all I those black you. people. I love it. Yeah. So, so then what happened? And the governor came. Well, by what's train. his name? The governor. How do I say his last name? Borrow. Borrow. Okay. Borrow. <laughs> Bra. B r o u g h. Okay. But came into. Um, he came by train with 500 troops and three machine guns on the train to Elaine because he was told that there was an insurrection. And they came into Elaine and there were black sharecroppers who were veterans of the war. Hold on, stop there. Hold on, stop mm -hmm. there. Don't forget the thought. Everybody, I want you to be quiet right now. Please don't say a word. Go ahead. <laughs> There were veterans who served in the military, served overseas for this country. When they saw troops coming, they thought the troops were coming to help, to keep peace, to you know help settle this. And they came out of hiding and were gunned down. And, you know, some of them were captured, jailed, but a lot of them were shot. It, you know, when you look at the pictures, you can actually see the troops going in the thicket, going in the woods, hunting. They were hunting Black people down, shooting them in the fields, shooting them everywhere. Men, women, and children. And there's pictures we, of this? There are some pictures of Miss Frances Hall, her body in front of her house lying there on the ground where they shot her in the throat, shot her in the neck. There's pictures of this, of this massacre. And you see one, you can't tell that there are bodies, but you look at the, you look at the men and the way they're all looking down at the ground and you can see, and the, we don't know if those are bodies, but what else would they be looking at? And you see all these little, you could, you know, back then the pictures are all black and white. You can't tell. And then you see the uh, car, you see the classes. Yeah, there, there are a lot of pictures. A lot of pictures. So then yeah. what happened? And you so know, that the happens troops, for how many days are they there killing people, whatever, whatever? They started a rep that by that second day when the troops got there, they started shooting and killing people and they arrested, you know, men and women, put them in the bottom, put them in the schoolhouse and housed them there took some of them to uh, the county seat to Helena, to the jail there. Most of them were taken to the, to the jail there. And they got the, what they call the ringleaders would end, eventually ended up being the Elaine 12, 12 men who were charged, convicted and sentenced to, to death, sentenced to the electric chair. When you look it up, you'll see those were the Elaine 12, but there was an additional 122 uh, defendants of black sharecroppers, men and women, who were charged and convicted and in prison. For Nothing to the white people. I'm sorry? Nothing to the white people. No, there were no, no white person was ever charged or even questioned about their role. How no does this more end? The little what what ends up happening after that? After um, 
after the, they uh, kill everybody and put everybody in jail day three day four then what happens they were still you'll see you know you'll read in one book on the laps of god you'll see uh even uh october 6th and 7th you'll see where there's reports of someone shot and killed in snow lake where i went to school someone shot and killed in uh this a little town that doesn't even exist anymore so it's called pulse well these little places they were still reporting that negroes as it's termed in the book or you know in the newspapers were still killed. They were still reports of the men shot and killed. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then come October 7th, that is the day a flyer went out and that flyer is widely available online. And it has the date October 7th, 1919, which tells uh, to all the Negroes, go back home, go back to work, stop talking, you know, pretty much be quiet and act like none of this happened. And it says on there, no Negro, that no innocent Negro was killed. The troops are here and they'll remain here to keep peace. That was the date, that's dated October 7, 1919. And to me, that's the date, October 7, 1919, that silence just embedded itself in the DNA of black people in Phillips County, especially in Elaine, because we grew up in that town and never heard a word about a massacre. I've only known about the massacre for 13, for 13 years and I'm in my fifties. Mm. Mm -hmm. So then what happened? Well, the, then they had the sham trial. Some of the trials lasted just mere minutes, seven or eight minutes. The Elaine 12, the, as they call them, the ringleaders, uh, they, it was a five year, they were you know, charged, sentenced, convicted, but they hired an attorney out of Little Rock. Uh, well, the NAACP hired an attorney for them out of Little Rock, um, Scipio A. Jones out of Little Rock. And he came, he, um, biracial, he came to Helena and uh, well, first they called and then they called Ida B. Wells, they sent a letter to Ida B. Wells. Ed Ware, one of the Elaine 12, sent a letter to Ida B. Wells and she came. She came to Little Rock first and went to the Dunbar community. And then she went to, met with some of the, the women, some of the women and children and took some of them to visit the men in prison. And she went there, visited them, got their story. She has the only, she wrote the only accounts, firsthand accounts of what happened, uh, those accounts of Black people, the ones who were charged, the ones who were jailed. She wrote the only accounts, wrote their stories. And if it were not, not for her writing their stories, we wouldn't have anything to collaborate our, our ancestor stories and our grandparents, what they told us. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the uh, Elaine 12 fought and won their freedom after five years. Oh, and really? Mm-hmm. Yep, fought and won their freedom after five years. Yep. And they were free. And they were pardoned and then they were, uh, but they had to get out of town because it was still on the books in Elaine uh, that, you know, those landowners were promised that if they were free, that they would be given the opportunity to hang them. So when they were free, they put them on, tr on trains and skirted them away to safety. And from, you know, I've learned that Ed and Frank Hicks had the part, they were brothers, my ancestors, they had the part and never communicated with each other again. For their safety and for their family's safety. But, you know, in the books is listed about 200, some people say 100, some people say 200, um, you know, black people were killed in Elaine, but you ask any of our grandparents, all that told they tell of stories of, you know, bodies being thrown in the Mississippi River and they're getting the bodies out of the Mississippi River and, you know, sneaking and then burying them, finding bodies in fields. So we, we know for a fact that it was way more than 200 killed because when you come in with machine guns, yeah, you're going to kill some people. And these were our own troops 
shooting and killing black people. But yep, this happened in Elaine, Arkansas. Uh, then what happened? Well, after um, you know, after Elaine, the letter, after they get back, they go back it, to sharecropping. They don't go back to meeting no more. That and, they and did stopped, they ever catch well, the guy, the Reverend guy? Is he one of the twelve? Well, uh, Robert L. Hill, no. Yes. Robert L. Hill, um, Robert L. Hill left and went to, he got away and went to Kansas. And then you see the newspaper, there are newspaper articles where they tried to have him extradited, tried to get the governor to extradite him back from Kansas, back to Arkansas to stand trial. And, but the governor wouldn't do it. He wouldn't extradite him back. And then they tried to get the sharecroppers the turn of they wrote and told you know put it in that newspaper and was telling the sharecroppers you see he took all of y'all trying to cause that division between Robert L Hill and the sharecroppers and uh, you know but he was extradited I mean he was in Kansas and they weren't able to extradite him back and he uh he was able to get away. Mm -hmm. I guess I got one more and then what happened. I mean, when does well, it when does it calm down? Do they stop sharecropping? Do they no? Nope. They continue to fight. They just they continue to sharecrop because you know you still they still got their. I mean, I know that some of the sharecroppers went back. Some of the wives went back to retrieve their things. They had taken their hogs, taken their uh, household goods. They had ransacked their houses, uh, taken their crops. The ones who had already harvested and bailed their cotton. They had taken their cotton. Some of the ones that were in print that were in jail, the white landowners were able to come down to the jail and vouch for them. And my grandmother told me stories that, yeah, I said, baby, when they went to the jail, the wives would ask the landowner, you know, go get my husband out of jail. Some of the wives had to promise to go work in the white landowner's house, babysitting and cleaning the house free for a year in order to get her husband out of prison or he had to promise to give up his harvest, give up all his, his goods, you know, his, his, you know, uh, to get out of jail. So they had to, some of them had to make deals to give up everything to be released from prison. Is there, is there any one white guy that helped? There are stories of in Snow Lake where uh, there were some white landowners when the mob came down that the white landowner stood up and said, no, these are good people and y'all are not gonna hurt them. Yeah, there's definitely stories that some of the white landowners, when they came, you know, they might've had sharecroppers who didn't even know the meeting was happening. And when they came there, wanna shoot, you know, kill them or, or take or arrest them, some of the white landowners stood up. There are definitely stories of them standing up and said, no, you're not gonna hurt these, you know. So yeah, there are stories of that happening. Is there anybody uh, 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 like, okay, how about a white person that over the years has said, I'm sorry? There is um, one gentleman, uh, J. Chester Johnson. He wrote a book, Damaged Heritage. And in his book, he, he found out that his grandfather was a member of the KKK and came from El Dorado and participated I think it's El Dorado in uh, Southern, South Arkansas, came and participated, got on the train, rode the train to Elaine and participated in killing black people in Elaine as a member of the KKK. So he wrote a book about uh, his grandfather and his grandfather's participation in that. Really? And he wrote an apology. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Mr. J, uh, J. Chester Johnson. So, and I'm, you know, have become good friends with him. Oh, really? Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah. now what do you want, uh, other than everybody to hear about it, mm -hmm. what, 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 what do you want to happen? I mean, what, what, what you, you want the story to get out, right? I, we want full acknowledgement. There are so many things we've been working on. And first and foremost, uh, and one of the main reasons why I started the Descendants of the Elaine Massacre of 1919 was to reclaim the narrative, reclaim the history and our telling of it. Because most of the books, all of the books, <laughs> I'm saying most, all of the books written about the Elaine Massacre have been written, the only the one, the one by J. Chester Johnson, he's been a descendant 
uh, you know, of the perpetrators, but all of the books have been written by white men who pretty much didn't have anything to do or not a descendant or even connected to Elaine or, you know, it, or, or never impacted by this massacre. So one of the things that I, you know, I'm advocating is, first of all, I'm helping to amplify the voices of the descendants because we've been kept in silence. You know, that's why I wear this shirt and say silent no more. I you know, it. our ancestors were silenced, deathly afraid, scared, told to go home and be quiet. And they took heed to that. It's like, like I say, that silence was embedded into, into their DNA, you know, and they kept quiet about it too. And they kept it a secret. The whole town did. The, all of Phillips County did. So, what it's important to me that we write our stories, write our ancestors' stories. I got you. You know, and to and make sure the truth is told, uh, because you know, as you know, the victor writes the history. Yeah, I got and, you. And yeah, the victor writes the history, and a lot of that history has yet to be told. A lot of the history of the Elaine Massacre is yet to be told. Are you going to so write so a book? Many of Are us you working with stories. somebody to write a book? I am. I am writing. I am working on a book. Uh, of my the stories my grandmother told me and a documentary would be another another angle I, it could be i'm not real yeah, good with put that. a documentary together it, i i could and um and what i wanted to put a, my plan had been if i'd been able to do you know we're having the elaine unity fest this um yeah, let's talk you know, about coming, that, yeah. Up, mm -hmm, coming up september 30th and of course with covid is having to be all virtual. So yeah, sure, it's from sure. September 30th mm -hmm, through October 3rd. And uh, we're going to do have some Zoom. We're going to have an Elaine Truth town hall. So we have a lot of things coming up, but it's going to be important. And, and I'm really trying to encourage and empower all of the descendants of the Elaine massacre victims to begin to write their family history, write their family stories. I mean, connect. I mean, I grew up with Francis Hall, the lady that's you know, you see her body in front of that church, in front of the house, her house where they killed her. And, you know, her, I grew up with, with that family. So yeah, all I of these you. people, mm -hmm. so, are, so are, right are people now, willing to do it? I'm sorry? Are people willing to do it? Oh yeah. Now they, they're, you know, writing their stories. So uh, they're not scared no more. Not scared anymore. Okay, not how scared about this anymore. I, I, is it, I, are you scared? Is somebody going to, Ain't nobody gonna do nothing to you. I mean, you got God on your side, but I, yeah. other than that, I, are you scared that hey, why are you bringing this up? I have not an ounce of fear. I'm love more it. afraid. Oh my God, I love it. I, <laughs> I love have it. not. I, I'm more afraid of not being afraid. That's what scares me. How unafraid I am because what is so important. I it's important. I had to let that fear leave this earth when my grandmother left this earth. Because when she told me her stories, she was so fearful, so scared, still the, the you know, the look of terror in her eyes when I asked her. And, and you talk about I this is many, many years later. Many, many years later. Many, many. She was still afraid. As she, you know, she said, so they might do something to my boys as they learn I'm talking to, you know, my brothers and my yes. uncle and stuff, they still working. She was afraid. But I learned how to, I, I learned and I respected that fear because she grew up, she was born in the 20s. So she had to go through the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. Right, she saw you. a lot. She saw a lot. And I respect that fear and I can respect the time in which she grew up in. I got you. Mm -hmm. But this it, is a different time now. This do the governor know now. about it? Do the people know about it? What you're trying to do and stuff like oh, yeah. that? Are they going to put a historical marker down and that kind of thing? We are working on it. We have so many pro. Oh, Ms. I, Blondie, I we have so many. We are, we are working. I'm actually, and I am. You know, I'm in Little Rock now, but I am moving back to Elaine. I'm moving back Ooh. home because I need to do this work on the ground. I need to be there on the ground with my community working. Ooh. And yeah, we we're gonna take this work back out of the hands of people who are not serving our ancestors well. There are people that are doing the work who are just, you know, not serving our answer and not serving our community well. So that's what I mean when I say reclaim the narrative, make sure our stories are told by us. Let me ask you this. Uh, we got to come to close at some point, but let me ask you, mm -hmm. what, what's at the church? That they Nothing. Shut it's, up? It's, a, it's just a field. 
It's just the field. You go there, you see where it'll tell you. Know, you kind of you can't even tell a church was there. It's just the field now. All you see is just the land. It's just the field, and usually in that spot, uh, you know, crops are grown. Is that where you would want to put the marker? No, I would not want to put a marker there. Oh, really? Not at that spot. I would, you know what I would want to put there? I would want to put the community they wanted to build. That's what I would want to put. And I would want to put a church that stood right at the end. If I could buy that land, I would put right there with uh, in Hoopsburg, I would put that church, build that church back and put a community right there on that land and name those streets after those 12 men who fought for their lives. That's what, that's a big dream. <laughs> that's what, what I, that is what I would want to put there. And of course a marker, but I would want it to be bigger than, I wouldn't just want a marker sitting yeah, alone you. in that bean field. I would want it to be, you know, it, I'm, I'm given, I want to, my, my goal is to finish where my ancestors started. I got you. They had, yeah, they had big dreams. They were working hard organizing, putting their money together. They already had plotted out. My grandmother showed me the land. She showed me the spot where they were, the land they were trying to buy, right there outside of Rashaw, three miles down from Eli. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, as we, I guess, kind of come to a close, what do you, um, how can people help you? People can help by going to Descendants of the Elaine Master of 1919. Going and, to the you know, website. Yeah, going, yeah, and liking and, and following our page. And definitely, most importantly, I would love for, for people to go to that page and attend the events. On the 30th. Uh, uh, on the 30th, you can go to eventhub.net mm -hmm, or go to uh, our Facebook page, Descendants of the Elaine Master of 1919, yeah. or my Facebook page. Can they, can they donate money? They can donate money. We have a GoFundMe, the GoFundMe. Is on, up, yeah. Mm -hmm, it's up on uh -huh, on that page, so they can definitely uh, go to go to that. But yeah, but there'll be a link um, on the platform, the eventhub.net platform. Yeah. Uh, the link for the GoFundMe and the link yes. for donations will be up on that link, and we're okay. gonna start that. Okay, we can blast yeah. that. Uh, has mm -hmm. anybody big hurt got contacted you yet? Has you know CNN or anything like that contacted I you yet? I was on, uh, uh, what's her name? Tiffany Cross. Tiffany on MSNBC. Okay, okay. I was on, we were, that was during Tulsa. When Tulsa was having their 100. Yes, yes. Yeah, so during Tulsa. So uh, she interviewed me. We, we were just talking about, you know, she was reminding people that there were other massacres that happened around the country that a lot of people didn't even know about. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm, yeah. she reached out and. Uh, okay. All right. I'm going to do what I can. I wish I could be there on the 30th. I really do. Mm -hmm. You can be there. It's all virtual. Yeah, I know it's virtual. Yeah, but I, I want to yeah. touch the land. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. But don't I, worry. I, I, Next I, year, uh, we're going to be on. We're going to talk offline. I ain't scared neither. <laughs> and I would love to come down there and have uh, a little festival. Oh, yeah, that'd be wonderful. We have a whole, we were deeded the Eli, the whole high school. We have a gyp, whole high school. That's what we're raising the money for. Okay. To rehab the high school and uh, turn it into a community hub. Okay. Uh huh. And we want to do some historical. Uh, stuff around okay. the Elaine massacre. Okay. Because yeah, we have the the high school okay, okay. gymnasium. I got so, you. Uh huh. All mm -hmm. right. All right. Uh, everybody. Um. Uh, you see why I got a, a shirt and tie on? <laughs> uh, I'm out of questions, people. <laughs> um, you had strong inspirations, <clears throat> and somehow she agreed to come on my channel, little old me. Uh, to help tell the story. I'm going to do the best I can to get it out. Uh, subscribe to the channel. Hit the like button on this video, please. Hit the notifications bell when the video comes up. You can be the first to watch it. Tell somebody about strong inspirations, but 
even if you don't tell them about strong inspirations, my friends, I'm okay with that. But tell them about what happened in Elaine. Tell mm -hmm. them about September 30th, mm -hmm. 2021, and the Unity Festival. Elaine Unity Festival. Tell them to get $20 together and send it down there. $20. $50, $100, let's, let's, let's get that building and make that happen. Um, tell them about this sister, Lisa Gilbert. Lisa Hicks Gilbert. <laughs> Hicks Gilbert. She be reading. She got books behind her. She's a good looking lady. She's strong, sister. Tell them about her. She's an icon. She's going down in history for what she's given her life for. Tell them about her. You got to tell them about strong inspirations. Please do this, my friends. And so with that, sister, I tell you, I say with all sincerity, I, I know, hold on, before I say that, you know what I would like for you to do? And what's that? Say a prayer. Oh. And you lead us in prayer. And, 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 and before you do that, that's going to be the closing work. To you, sister, mm -hmm. I say with all sincerity, I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind. I love what you're doing, putting your life on the line, your time and everything else to keep this word good and alive and to let it share and let the light grow. Uh, lead us uh, uh, in prayer. And that's the closing remarks. Mm -hmm. All right. Lord, we, we come before you this evening, thanking you for all we have learned and all we're about to learn, Lord. We thank you for giving all of us inspiration because we know with that comes our strength and comes and keep us to help keep our resilience into the times in which we live and the times in which our ancestors had to fight through. Lord, I thank you so much for giving me the strength, giving me the courage when it is most needed. And Lord, all I ask is that you enlarge my territory so that as I serve you and I serve my community, Lord, I allow that to spread across this land. Lord, thank you so much for keeping me through the times when I had doubt and when the times in which I should have been afraid, Lord. But I knew that through you and through what I've learned in my life from my grandparents and through my parents, Lord, I thank you so much for all you have given me and all you're about to give me so that I can serve, serve my community, Lord, with your guidance. I thank you for everything I have and I'm about to have and everything I'm about to give. In your name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Bye-bye. We out. <laughs>